My name is Don Kurtz. I'm professor of astrophysics at the University of Central Lancashire. You can hear I have a North American accent. I was born and raised in California of a Canadian mother. And then I spent 25 years at the University of Cape Town, where I rose to professor of astrophysics before coming to the University of Central Lancashire 12 years ago in 2001. My specialty is a field called astroseismology, the songs of the stars, the real music of the spheres. I use this in my teaching. My students are involved in the research. And I'm now going to tell you about that, explain to you how astroseismology works and why it's such an interesting field. Let's start by taking a trip to the constellation Orion. Many of you will recognize Orion, but this picture I'm showing you now is not actually a picture of the sky. This is a computer generated image which was made by a colleague of mine, Zoltan Kolath, at Konkoli Observatory in Budapest in Hungary. He's made a picture of the constellation of Orion using data from a satellite that orbited the Earth and measured the distances to the stars. And we're now going to take a trip to the constellation of Orion towards the belt of Orion at a speed of 200 million times the speed of light. Now, I know you've watched Star Trek and you've seen how the stars whiz by when we're doing warp 10. This is 200 million times the speed of light and the stars are so far away, even in this movie, they don't go whizzing by. Most stars are much fainter than the sun, and you'll see them as little tiny dots flying off the screen here. Some stars are brighter than the sun. Some stars are hotter than the sun. And I'll describe those stars to you as we whiz out to Orion at 200 million times the speed of light. That very strange music you're hearing is a composition by a Hungarian composer named Jeno Koiler with Zoltan Koloth's help. Every instrument in the orchestra that you're listening to is a real star. The stars have sounds in them, and since we can hear those sounds, and much more importantly, we can use those sounds to see inside the stars. Notice the bright red star coming towards you now in the upper left of the picture. That's the star Betelgeuse. If you could put that where the Sun is, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, even Jupiter would be inside the surface of the star. It's a bright red giant. We study that star and stars like it with the sounds that are in them. When I was a student over 40 years ago, taking astronomy for the first time now, as my students who come to the University of Central Lancashire are doing with me with introductory astronomy, I bought a book which is still on my bookshelf. It was then 40 years old in the 1960s. It's called The Internal Constitution of the Stars, and it's by the great British astrophysicist Sir Arthur Stanley Eddington. Eddington starts this book with these words. He says, at first sight, the interior of the sun and stars is less accessible to scientific investigation than any other region of the universe. Our telescopes may probe farther and farther into the depths of space, but how can we ever obtain certain knowledge of that which is hidden behind substantial barriers? What appliance can pierce through the outer layers of a star and test the conditions within? Eddington had an excellent answer to that question. It's what his book was about. We know the laws of physics. We know the laws of gases. We understand chemistry. We can calculate what the inside of a star is like. Eddington wrote the theory of that in this book, The Internal Constitution of the Stars, but he thought we would never see inside a star. Forty years later, after he wrote the book, just as I was an undergraduate learning astronomy, a new field arose, which is now quite a big field called astroseismology. That thump a dump a sound you're listening to is the sound of a pulsating red giant. A giant star, like Betelgeuse, thumping and ringing with the sounds that are reverberating inside it. When my colleague Connie Arts the Catholic University of Leuven. The team she was working with released that sound a few years ago. She found just a short time later, young people in Belgium were dancing to the sounds of the music of that star. What good is astronomy? Well, one practical application is we can use the world's biggest telescopes to produce disco music. There's now a textbook in the field of astroseismology. It's the very first one, published two years ago by Connie Arts, my colleague in Belgium, Jorn Christensen Dalsgar, another colleague of mine in Denmark, and me. We've written a textbook 800 pages long that covers the entire field, and the students who come here to the University of Central Lancashire learn from me cutting-edge, up-to-date 
research in this field. We humans are incredibly visual creatures. To you and to me, seeing is believing. I take my dog out for a walk and she sniffs things, looks around, and she says seeing's okay, but you know, if you really want to know something, smelling's believing. You see, you've got this movie theater running in your mind. The light comes into your eyes, hits your retina, and the energy's absorbed. It's turned into an electrochemical signal that passes down your optic nerve to a piece of your brain that interprets vision, and you've got this movie theater running in your mind. As you listen to me speak, the sound waves from my voice are pushing your eardrums in and out, and the energy from that's turned into an electrochemical signal, very similar to the signal that goes down your optic nerve and that creates vision for you, but now the signal from your ears goes to a different part of your brain and you have a very different sensation of hearing. Other creatures on this planet navigate their environment and see the world around them using sound. We humans have learned to do that. Here's the picture of a face of a fetus taken in a hospital before it's born. This is a baby to be and yet we're looking at its face. We've done that using ultrasound. We've used sound waves to penetrate the womb, perfectly safe for the mother and for the baby. And from the information we get from the sound waves, we've created a picture and there you see the face of the baby. We can also do that with the stars. What is a sound wave? Sound's a pressure wave. It's a compression and a rarefaction, in this case in the gas and the air as I speak to you. And this diagram showing you that, these little dots are supposed to be the atoms and the molecules of air in the atmosphere, mostly nitrogen, some oxygen, a bit of argon, some carbon dioxide, some water vapor. And as I speak, I cause the air to vibrate, the pressure goes up and down, and that information travels out through the air at the speed of sound. Here in the Earth's atmosphere, that's 343 meters per second. Pushes your eardrum in and out, and you hear me speaking. If we raise the temperature in the room, if the gas were hotter, the molecules in the air would move faster. They would bump into each other more often and the sound would travel faster. And so by measuring the speed of sound, we can measure the temperature of the gas. If, on the other hand, you were breathing a different gas, and I bet most of you have done this, imagine you're at a party and you get a helium balloon and you untie it and you breathe a lung full of helium. That's safe, helium's inert. You don't want to keep doing it. You'd suffocate if you did, but it won't cause any damage to do it with just one lung full of helium. You do that and you talk and you sound like Donald Duck very high-pitched squeak and everybody has a good laugh. What's happened? Helium's much lighter than air. And so at the same temperature, the helium atoms move around much more quickly than the molecules of nitrogen and oxygen, and you get a much higher sound speed in the helium than in the air. So if I can measure the sound speed in a gas, I can tell its temperature, I can tell its chemical composition. From those, I can tell the pressure, I can tell the density. Stars are made out of gas. And so my goal in astroseismology is to measure the sound speed throughout the entire interior of a star and use that to see inside the star. The range of hearing for humans is between about 30 cycles per second and about 18,000 cycles per second for young people. That unit, a cycle per second, an oscillation per second, we call a hertz. And so at the deepest sound that you can actually hear is about 30 hertz or 30 cycles per second. That's deep bass. Sounds lower than that you can feel sometimes as a rumble, but you don't actually hear them. Up at the upper end of the range, 18,000 cycles per second, young people can hear that, kids can hear that, old guy like me can't hear it anymore. As we get older, we lose our high frequency hearing. Other animals can hear outside that range. Take bats, for example. This is a leaf-nosed bat, and he lets out an incredibly loud squeal at a frequency of 50,000 hertz. We can't hear that. And that bat sees its environment that way through sound. Now, does it really see? Well, when I was a graduate student in Texas, in the United States, uh, one of the things I liked to do was go caving. And we would go caving, spelunking, just as it was getting dark. I mean, why waste your time during daylight hours in a cave? We'd wait till the sun went down. And as the sun went down, we had head into the cave with our lights to go caving. And as we're going into the cave, 10,000 bats are coming out. They never hit me. They don't hit each other. They get outside and they can catch the tiniest little insects, little bugs in the environment that are their food. The sound wave that they put out comes back to their ear. They're listening for it and from that they know where everything is in their environment. They know where their food is. They know how to find each other. They can avoid obstacles in the environment. I would claim, you can't get in the mind of another creature, but I bet that that bat has got a movie theater running in its mind. It can see with sound. 
And that's one of the take home messages right now. You can see with sound. Bats do it, dolphins do it, and we astroseismologists, we astronomers do it. Doctors, of course, do it in, in the hospital using ultrasound. Now, those terrible loud sounds you just heard are the sounds of bats. They're too high for us to hear, so is that really what bats sound like? Well, we've got recording equipment that can record sounds up to 50,000 hertz, and we've recorded the sound of the bat, and then we've lowered it down into the audible so you can listen to it as you just did in that recording. Those sounds are as true to the original bat sound as a piece of music is true to the original music if you do a key change. A key change in music means we start on a different frequency than the frequency, the note, that the composer specified when he wrote the music. But then we keep the ratios of the frequencies all the same. We keep the loudness of each note the same. We keep the time when the note starts. We call that phase the same. And to you and to me, unless you have perfect pitch, that melody sounds to be the same melody. That sounds to be the same piece of music. With the bats, we've done that. We've lowered their sounds down into the audible so we can listen, but we've remained true to the original bat sound just as we remain true to the original music when we make a key change. And so I think you can believe, okay, if you could hear bats, that's what they would sound like. At the other end of the range, we've got things like blue whales, which emit sounds that are so deep, mostly you can't hear them. Now the sound you're listening to now is a warning call of a blue whale. It's incredibly loud, and it reverberates through the oceans from one end of the planet to the other. We've boosted it up into the audible since it's a little bit too low for us to hear so that you can hear it, but we've remained true to the original music. If you could get in the water with a blue whale when it lets out a sound like that, its loudest yells have a volume of 180 decibels. The loudest sound you can listen to without having your eardrums damaged is 120 decibels, and that means that whale is one million times louder. If you were in the water with the whale when it let out a sound like that, the concussion would probably kill you. We boost those sounds of the whales up into the audible, and you say, oh yeah, well that sounds like a whale. We do the same things with the stars. The stars' sounds are even deeper than those from the whale. You couldn't hear them directly, but we can capture them, and we can boost them into the audible so you can listen to them. And that piece of music you heard earlier, composed of star sounds, that's how the composer did that, using sounds from the actual stars. Now, here's a diagram that shows how astroseismology really works. This is the toughest diagram I'm going to show you. This is supposed to be the cross-section through a star. First of all, let me just make sure you know what a star is, and you're with me on this. A star, like the sun, is a giant ball of gas. There's no solid, it's only gaseous. Surface of the sun has a temperature of 6,000 degrees. The core of the sun has a temperature over 15 million degrees. And the sun is huge. If I could shrink it down to the size of my head, then on that scale, the next nearest star would be the size of your head. But my head's here in Preston, that's the sun, your head, Alpha Centauri, which is the same size as my head on that scale, needs to be around Moscow, maybe 4,000 kilometers away. It's a long, long way between the stars. They're very far apart. They're huge, but mostly it's empty space out there. This cross-section I'm showing you here, then, is a cut through a, a ball of gas vastly bigger than the Earth, 100 times bigger in diameter than the Earth, a million times bigger in volume. And those lines you see show the way that the sound waves move down through the star. Some of the sound waves go very deep in the star. Some of them only penetrate shallowly underneath the surface. And by looking at many, many different sound waves, hearing them coming from the star, I can map out the sound speed from the surface of the star down to the core. In the case of the sun, I can do that to a part in a thousand from its surface right to its very center. I can see inside the sun using sound, like a bat sees its environment using sound, and I can see the interior of the sound in more detail than the face of that fetus you saw earlier. So is this what I do as an astronomer? I wander out under the sky and I hold up a big ear listening to the stars, and you've already thought of that for yourself. Of course I don't. The sounds can't get out of the stars. Sound can't travel in a vacuum. It's a compression wave typically in a gas for a star. So how can I listen to the stars? Is that really real? Is it really the sounds from the stars we're hearing? Well, imagine right now you pull out your phone. You pick it up and you call mom. You say, hi, mom, and she says, hi, kid. And out of your phone comes mom's voice. Is that really her voice? Is that mom you're hearing? Well, not really. Her voice hasn't come to you. Her voice has been turned into an electrical signal inside of her phone. 
It's then been broadcast by her phone as a microwave, and microwaves are just long wavelength light. They're just like the light that you see, except the wavelength is too long to see with your eyes, but we can pick it up with a microwave tower in the phone network that you subscribe to, and then rebroadcast it as another microwave, a kind of light, down to your phone where the signal's picked up, the information's used, we drive a speaker, and out of your phone comes mom's voice. Well, as an astronomer, I do something like that. We can't hear the stars directly, but the sounds in them cause them to vibrate. They get bigger and smaller, hotter and cooler, they get brighter and dimmer. And so here's a plot showing how a star gets brighter or dimmer over just a day from the Kepler space mission. And as it gets brighter and dimmer, I can record the light coming from it and easily pick up the vibrations. And those tell me exactly what the sound's doing. They tell me what the sound frequency is, how loud it is, when it starts, all the things you need to know about a sound wave. And I can, just as with your phone, recreate your mother's voice. I can, from the star, from the light waves, recreate the sound coming from the star. Another way I do that is with something called radio velocity. As the stars vibrate, the surface comes towards me and moves away. And as it does that, there's a shift in the frequency of the light. Now, you're used to that kind of shift in frequency. We call it a Doppler shift for normal, everyday things like a siren from an ambulance coming down the road, which as it comes towards you is high pitch and as it goes away is lower pitch. Or a Formula One car, Lewis Hamilton, coming down the straightaway, you're listening to it, the car comes towards you at high pitch and goes away at low pitch. Every kid playing cars in a sandbox knows that cars go meow as they go by on the straightaway. As we watch light, it also gets shifted to high frequency and low frequency as the star comes towards us and goes away from us. And that produces a curve like you see here of the velocity of the star coming towards us or moving away. And from that, I can find out about the music inside the star. Why should the star have sound waves? What generates the sound? Well, look at this absolutely amazing graphic video that was produced by a Japanese person after the giant earthquake last year in March of 2011. This shows a map of Japan and the little circles you're looking at, each circle represents an earthquake. The bigger the circle, the bigger the earthquake. The louder the sound, the bigger the earthquake. The little arm shows you how deep the earthquake is. And you'll see already as we start here, in late February, there have been 838 earthquakes already in Japan last year up to the end of February. Now, as I start this movie, you'll see just the background rate. Japan is on a subduction zone. A plate, the Pacific plate, is pushing under Japan, and as the rocks rub together, they cause the country to shake. But there, the big one has hit. March 11th, and just look at the incredible earthquakes going on there. Look at the rate of earthquakes. As I speak to you now, which is well into September 2012, the shaking has not gone back to normal yet a year and a half later after that big earthquake. With that big earthquake in Japan, the whole earth started to shake with sound waves going through it, and it shook for an entire month. We use those sound waves to do what we call geoseismology, and we can look inside the Earth. We can see right to its core. We can tell you the core is made of iron. We can tell you the temperature of the inside of the Earth is 6,000 degrees from those sound waves that penetrate the Earth that are caused by this giant earthquake. Now, I actually was in Japan at the time of that earthquake. I was at the top of a 10-story building at the University of Tokyo when the earthquake hit, and here's what my office looked like when I was finally allowed back in three hours later with things having tumbled over. So here on the Earth, the sound waves are generated by an earthquake, causes the whole Earth to ring like a giant bell and sound waves run through it to let us look inside the Earth. What makes a star shake? What makes something like the sun shake? The sun is full of storms. It has magnetic storms. It has great crackling storms of breaking magnetic fields with bolts of electricity running through it. It has huge columns of rising gas falling columns of cool gas, giant storms. The entire sun is full of noise from these storms, and those storms cause the entire sun to vibrate and sound waves to run through the sun. That lets me look inside the sun to tell you the inside core temperature of the sun is 15.4 million degrees. I can tell you that the core of the sun, even though it's gas, is about eight times denser than this gold wedding band I'm wearing here, which is a very dense metal here on the Earth. The gas in the sun is denser than gold here on the Earth. How do I know that? Because the sound waves that I see vibrating on the surface penetrate to the core, and I can see the inside of the sun. 
I can also watch the surface of the sun, which has these great storms. Now, here's a movie taken from space. It's taken in ultraviolet light, which we can't see, so we've artificially colored it with just green light. It has been sped up. It takes about 25 days to rotate. Here, it just takes a matter of minutes to rotate. And as you watch, there are bright spots, great storms in the sun, and you'll even see flashes of light, snapping magnetic fields. Those produce flares. They produce coronal mass ejections that can blast the Earth. And when we get blasted, if we had astronauts out in space, it could kill them. It can shut down power stations here on the Earth. It can disrupt radio communication. A really big flare from the sun, like one that happened in 1859, could wipe out our computer networks and the entire internet. And so we want to watch these storms on the sun. But as the sun rotates, they disappear around the back of the sun for a couple of weeks. With the sounds in the sun, we now watch those. The back of the sun never disappears. We can watch the storms. We can keep an eye on these important events that could have an effect of life here on the Earth. What does a pulsating star look like? Here's a movie from a supercomputer. This originally was two terabytes of data, reduced to only a gigabyte in my computer, so you can watch it here. Produced at the Laboratory for Computing and Science and Engineering at the University of Minnesota. And this is something like that sound you listened to earlier, that pulsating red giant we're listening to again now, that thump -a dump -a sound. It's the sound of a star like this. The storms in the star produce this red and blue oscillations you see. Those are hot rising and cool falling columns of gas. And notice how it set the entire star to pulsating. If you could get close to one of these pulsating stars and speed it up a bit, this is what it would look like. What can I do with this? Well, I can see inside the stars. Uh, why is it important to know what's happening inside the stars? Well, we astronomers figured out some decades ago that stars shine by fusing the lightest element hydrogen to helium. Later, when they're red giants, they fuse helium to carbon, and some very giant stars explode and blast their material back, at, material back out into space. They produce things like nitrogen, oxygen, iron. The chemical constituents of your body were cooked up in nuclear reactions inside stars, and we now know that. Except for the hydrogen in the water that makes up most of your body, all of the other elements that make you, that make me, that make chemistry, were cooked up in stars in nuclear reactions. That's a great thing to know. That nuclear fusion that the sun does, hydrogen fusion, we now understand. And we're now building power plants that will run off of hydrogen fusion. It's a very complex problem. It's a very difficult engineering problem. In the south of France at Cataract, we're building the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor. And I would predict that by the end of this century, hopefully sooner, hydrogen fusion will be the power source for humanity for the rest of time. We'll quit burning coal. We'll quit burning oil. We'll quit pumping out carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. We'll eliminate greenhouse warming and global warming problems. Hydrogen fusion will become the energy source for humanity. That's the biggest payoff of all time financially, and it came from understanding the insides of stars. Let's ask another big question. One of the biggest questions anybody can ask is, are we alone? Are we the only things living in the universe? We astronomers are working on that problem. And one of the ways to do that is to try to find planets like the Earth. A first step is to answer the question, are there other planets like the Earth out there? And right now, there's a space mission doing that. It's called the Kepler Space Telescope. The Kepler mission is a one-meter space telescope orbiting the sun looking for planets like the Earth. It stares out at a piece of the sky in the constellation Lyra and Cygnus, looking at about 150,000 stars. Now, almost 30 years ago, I got invited to a meeting in San Diego, California, by a man named Bill Barucki, who wanted to find planets by watching the tiny, tiny dip in light as a planet passes in front of its star and blocks out a bit of the starlight. And all of us who were working on measuring brightnesses of stars just said, Bill, you can't do that. It's impossible. Forget it. The blurring of the atmosphere, the brightness of the light in the air just completely makes that impossible. You haven't got a chance. But Bill Barucki has got a lot of tenacity. He pushed and he pushed and he applied. 30 years later, he is the principal investigator of the Kepler space mission. He raised $600 million to launch the space telescope into orbit. And it's now looking at 150,000 stars watching for the shadow of a planet passing in front of the star and then coming across the telescope. There's the constellation 
Cygnus and Lyra, which the telescope's looking at. And what it's trying to do is it's trying to find not just planets like the Earth, but planets in what we call the habitable zone. In this diagram at the top, we're representing a star much hotter than the sun. Much hotter than the sun for a star to be in the habitable zone where there would be liquid water, the planet would have to be farther away than the Earth is from the sun. The middle, that's a star like the sun, and we're looking for planets orbiting the same distance the Earth is from the sun, so it orbits with periods of about a year. And then many stars, as I showed you in that movie of Orion, many stars are fainter than the sun, and they're also much cooler. And for a planet around a star like that to be in the habitable zone, the planet has to be closer to the star, and so it will orbit it in a period much less than a year. How does the Kepler mission work? Well, as the planet passes in front of the star, it causes what we call a transit. It transits the star, and the light dips by a minuscule amount, a few parts in a million in some cases. From the ground, we can't see that. From the ground, we can only measure the brightness of a star to a precision of about one part in a thousand. The Kepler mission can measure the brightness of a star to one part in a million, and so now we can see the dip in starlight as a planet transits its star. Before the Kepler mission was launched, we knew of a few dozen planets around other stars. They're called exoplanets. And in this diagram on the y-axis, the vertical axis, we're planning how, plotting how big the planet is. Down there, the line at the bottom is the size of the Earth. There's another line for the size of Neptune and another line for the size of Jupiter. And then along the x-axis, how long it takes the planet to orbit its star from one day up to a couple hundred days. And you'll notice all the planets we discovered were basically big giant planets like Jupiter made out of gas, and they orbited their stars very quickly, just a couple of days, incredibly hot planets close to their stars. Down in the lower right corner, where planets like the Earth would be, nothing. Now with the Kepler mission, as of December 2011, not quite a year ago, look at all the planets we found, over 2,000 of them. And notice they're pushing down into that lower right corner. We've now found with the Kepler mission planets that are rocky like the Earth, just a little bit bigger than the Earth so far, a few a little bit smaller, but not in the habitable zone. We're now homing in on those planets that are the size of the Earth, orbiting where water can be liquid, where we might find life around another planet. Now, that's a long way from actually seeing such a planet. All we're seeing is the dip in starlight, the shadow of the planet passing across the Earth. How do we know how big a planet is? The answer is we can tell that by the amount of light it blocks out from its star, but we need to know how big the star is. How do we know what the density of the planet is? How do we know it's made of rock? We need to know what the mass of the star is. And so when the Kepler mission was launched, the NASA team came to astroseismologists like me, a group of us, there are 550 of us in the Kepler Astroseismic Science Consortium on which I serve on the steering committee, because we can tell from the sounds in the stars what the mass of the star is, how big the star is, and that lets us characterize these planets. We are pushing to discovering planets the size of the Earth where there's liquid water. The next step is the James Webb Space Telescope to be launched in 2018 out beyond the moon, and then the European Extremely Large Telescope, a 39-meter diameter telescope costing 1.2 billion euros, now planned to be built in Chile, which will be capable not of seeing the planet directly, but of taking a spectrum, and if it's a planet like the Earth, we'll find that there's oxygen in the atmosphere, and there's methane, and methane and oxygen are highly reactive. Here in the Earth, the methane comes out of cows, it comes out of termites. It tells you there's life on that planet. We're headed in that direction. In the meantime, the Kepler mission's fantastic for me in astroseismology. It finds all sorts of things. Planet-wise, it's found a planet which we called Tatooine, the fictional Luke Skywalker in Star Wars lived on a planet that was supposed to be orbiting two stars, a binary star, and he could see a double sunset. We found planets like Tatooine with the Kepler mission. There are planets out there orbiting double stars. With the vibrations in stars, my colleague Hiromoto Shibahashi at the University of Tokyo and I have invented a technique now where by watching the vibrations we can find planets around the stars from the astroseismology and we're pushing now to find planets in places we'd never find them before. And here's an artist's impression of a planet we found with that sort of technique a few years ago, orbiting a star that at one time was like the sun. And as it swelled to be a red giant, it would have evaporated its planet as we used to think the sun was going to do to the Earth. But we found with this star you're looking at this artist's impression of here, it's called V391b Pegasi, 
not a very romantic name. We found for that star that the planet drifted away from the stars. It evolved to be a red giant and it survived. And so we can now tell you, you should feel more comfortable, that the sun is not actually going to annihilate the Earth and vaporize it. It's going to blow away the atmosphere. It's going to kill everything on the planet. It's going to melt the continents. But an old rock will survive around the sun when it eventually dies. Well, news magazines have been running articles on the weird stars we've been finding with the Kepler mission. Here's a magazine from the United States called Science News, which interviewed me for this article to talk about the strange stars that are being found with the Kepler mission. One of those strange kinds of stars we call the heartbeat stars. This is a light curve you're looking at, how bright the star is versus time, and you'll see it's going blip, 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 blip. Looks something like an electrocardiogram. Those blips come once every 41 days. What's happening, the two stars are orbiting each other in a very eccentric orbit, and as they pass close to each other every 41 days, they almost touch, and you get this bright spike of light. The bottom, you'll also see that they're wobbling, and that wobbling lets us look inside them and study their interiors. I have a student here at the University of Central Lancashire, Kelly Hamilton, who's doing her PhD on these stars now. Five years ago, Kelly was an introductory astronomy student taking my first year astronomy course here at the University of Central Lancashire. Now, she's an astronomer who travels the world, goes to international meetings, observes with big observatories around the world, and works with data from the Kepler Space Telescope. In five years' time, from introductory astronomy at the University of Central Lancashire to a PhD student funded by the Science and Technologies Facility Council and doing forefront research on stars that we didn't even know existed when she was a first-year undergraduate five years ago. We saw at the beginning that Sir Arthur Stanley Eddington asked this question, what appliance can pierce through the outer layers of a star and test the conditions within? Astroseismology, the real music of the spheres, is the answer to that. Here at the University of Central Lancashire, our students come to us and start as physics, maths, astronomy student their first year, and they take their beginning astronomy from me. The other classes, they're taking their courses from professional scientists, from researchers who are doing forefront research, the most advanced science that's happening anywhere on the planet, and the students are introduced to that research along with their beginning studies as soon as they arrive here at the University of Central Lancashire. There are a wide range of study options and research opportunities in astronomy and astrophysics at the University of Central Lancashire. To find out more, please visit our website at star.uclan.ac.uk.